welcome to today's webinar. My name is Skylar Cunningham with Lean Frontiers, and I will serve as your host today. You can also see on the screen our presenter, Oscar Roche. Just a few points of logistics before we get started. Today's short presentation is being recorded, so look for an email shortly after this recording with a link to view this session on demand. Please share it with those in your organization. A copy of today's PowerPoint presentation is available for download on the GoToWebinar toolbar to your right. Due to the short nature of this webinar, we will not be fielding questions. If you do not have question, or if you do have questions, Oscar will share his email address and you can email him directly. Today's webinar is part of a series of webinars on the subject of standardization. Look for an email shortly after today's session for links to the other webinars in the series. So with that, let me introduce our presenter, Oscar Roche. Oscar believes in two things that drive his endeavors in building capability. One, people must have trust in his intent. Two, nothing is more effective and liberating than saying, I'm not sure, than learning by doing. As director of the Australian, New Zealand, and Southeast Asian TWI Institute Global Partnership, Oscar is mindful of these two things daily. He frequently quotes a manager he's met who said, the more I know, the more I realize I don't know. He feels that as long as he maintains that mindset, he can be the ser of service to others. Finally, he loves Mark Rosenthal's quote of, teach to extend their knowledge threshold, not to demonstrate yours. With that, I will hand it over to Oscar. Thanks, Skylar. Thank you for that introduction. And thanks everyone, as I do each time when I do these, for choosing to join, join me for this half an hour. You don't have to be here, and I really appreciate the um, the numbers particularly we're getting on this topic, it's refreshing to see that it's pretty popular. We've got over well over 400 registrations for this webinar, so, as we did for the others. So again, much appreciated. Thank you. All right, so when I saw that Mark, the, uh, another of those Mark Rosenthal quotes that you can see on the screen, execution brings up organisational problems, and this is just normal. <clears throat> I guess there was two things that flashed through my mind. One is, I think we tend to shy away from organisational problems, um, not be embarrassed by them, that's not the right word, but we, we certainly shy away from them uh, and, and think that they're abnormal or we shouldn't have them. And, and I think it's um, there's an opportunity to, through this type of uh, the, the philosophies of standardised work to, to move away from that and almost celebrate them, I guess. And the second thing is that the, um, that the, the philosophies of the step-up model really give a, a common start point or an objective to these problems that are servicing, which is perfectly normal. So I guess that's the theme of this discussion, partly. And also, uh, the other thing I want to cover is the learnings I've had since uh, probably in the last six months, but in particular, since the last webinar we did in this series, which was on May the 20th. All right, so let, let's start with a bit of a refresher, which is the model itself. So as I've said in the others, and I'll, I'll um, if you haven't seen the previous webinars, that'll this will be a little bit rushed. But um, for those who, uh, you can have a look at the ones as previous ones as Skylar mentioned. But for those who have, this is a bit of a refresher. So in all organisations, we have work. Work's going on in service manufacturing on all organisations. When we apply the five step up model, <clears throat> the first thing is we develop work standards. And what the, the output or the outcome of a work standard is for us to, to be able to clearly identify normal. So the work standard clearly identifies what's normal relating to the output, relating to the machine or the process, a set the variables, for example, in the machine, and also the variables for what the person does. So three levels of standards, essentially, three levels of standards, the output, the machine, and the person. And from those standards, we clearly communicate, or we've clearly identified normal. Then we problem solve abnormal. We build adherence to standard work through the verb of standardization, uh, it's a doing word, standardization. So through PDCA, we problem solve abnormal and we build adherence to our work standards. And through over time, um, we will develop, a f um, through uh, application of the philosophies, we develop efficient standardized work, which is in summary, production at tact, we're producing at the rate that the customer is ordering. The work is sequenced precisely. So there is very, very minimal 
waste in uh, or maximum utilization of machine and people capabilities and there is just enough materials and work in progress to keep this for the system not to stop but there's no excess so this is step up step up one is the development of the work standards step up two is in two and three uh, problem solving the abnormal and building adherence to work standards. At that point, you would have, you could be um, seen to have standardized work. And then through step up four and step up five, we gain this efficient standardized work. Well, that's where we've got our genuine continuous improvement happening. Step up four is uh, about rapid problem solving and about uh, addressing root cause. Um, and, and that's where the genuine continue and, and sorry, and raising the bar, if you like. Um, sorry, I've got that a bit twisted there. Step up three is about genuine problem solving and um, addressing root cause. Step up four is where we raise the bar, where we, where we raise the standard of normal and strive to achieve that. So step up four is where we have genuine continuous improvement. And step up five is where we have a rigorous system of checks and balances to make sure we're doing step up four and one, two, and three. Because the application of step up four can quite often take you back to step up one, step up two, and step up three. And that's where that um, the, 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 the genuine continuous improvement comes in. We go back to the start and we follow that PDCA cycle to raise the bar. The refreshing thing that Mr. Cato said to us in October last year was this, not every organization can and needs to get to step up five but substantial benefit will be gained by adopting the philosophies of standardized work as far as you can as uh, to take you as far as is commercially uh, commercially needed so that was quite refreshing to hear him say that you know very few organizations get to uh, step up five uh, not so many get to step up four uh, some are at step up three is the feedback he gave us most are operating around the step up two area but by adopting these philosophies, a lot can be gained, and it's often not commercially necessary to, to uh, get right up to the step up five level. And also, I think this model uh, uh, helps us, or helps me anyway, with this definition of lean. Uh, I struggled for a number of years with the definition of lean, probably since the late 90s until the mid 2000s. And um, sorry, mid 2010s, around 2015. Uh, I struggled a lot with the definition of lean until I saw this one, that lean is developing people who can and are solving problems and making improvements daily. Now, if you think of the step up model, step ups two and three, once we've got step up one, we've determined normal. Step up two and three is about solving problems. And then once we've got that stability and our work is standardized, step ups four and five are about making improvements daily. So. So this step up model ties in with that definition of lean in my mind very nicely. All right, so that's the model. How does this fit in with my uh, Mark's opening, uh, the quote I had in the opening slide? Was that if we're gonna problem solve abnormal, then through development, we've developed our work standards, we're gonna problem solve abnormal. Execution brings up these organizational problems and this is, this is almost what we're seeking. So once we have normal, we want to be able to, we, we need to, and we want to be able to problem solve abnormal. So execution brings up these organizational problems and it's perfectly okay. We're not gonna develop our work standards and we're never gonna have abnormals. That's just not gonna happen. So we, it, we should be celebrating when we see the abnormal because, because that's, that's almost what we should expect and it's an opportunity to improve as we move up, uh, apply the step up two and three philosophies. So the, the establishment of normal through our work standards makes these organizational problems normal. It is what we want, it is what we're seeking, and it is what we're going to address. So it ties in really nicely, I feel. So let's look at the why, and this is getting into some of the learnings uh, in the last, um, uh, the major learnings in the last sort of, probably the last four months in particular, but over the last six as to why this step up one and these work standards are so vitally important. There's a statement there that I quoted in one of the, in a couple of the previous webinars. If you don't have a clear expectation of what good looks like, then your definition of not good is subjective and varies depending on who, what, and when things are being looked at. And that was written in the Lean Thinker in December, 2019. So if you think about this, 
If we don't have a clear expectation of what good looks like, then problem solving abnormal and building adherence to work standards is much harder because the first thing you've got to do is sort through specialist opinions. So if you don't have a clear expectation of what good looks like, then the first thing we, we end up doing is sorting through um, uh, specialist opinions. I had a terrific example of this at a, a beverage packing client about two weeks ago when I was in talking to the, one of the line leaders who's pretty familiar with this topic, is apply, working with us to apply this topic. And the, and, um, the QA guy walked in um, and said to the, uh, to the line leader, said, does maintenance know about that, uh, the sanitizer nozzle on filler number two, whatever number it was, does maintenance know about that sanitizer nozzle? And the leading hand said, what about it? And, he, and the QA said, well, the spray that comes on every five minutes between filling cycles is just coming out as a bit of a bit of a dribble. And the line leader said, well, how should it come out? And he said, oh, well, it should be a spray and it should do this and it should do that. And the line leader said, well, it's never done that. Um, and then for about the next seven or eight minutes, I didn't time it, there was a conversation about what the spray should look like. And as the QA, QA guy walked away, I said to the line leader, what happened there? And he said, we don't have a definition of what good looks like. And, that's, and that was the root cause of that problem. And I said, exactly. I said, what are you going to do now? I said that to the line leader. And he said, I'm going to go, I better go and see maintenance about it. I said, what do you think is going to happen there? And he said, well, well, I'll probably have the same conversation with maintenance. I said, how long will that take? He said, oh, 10 minutes, maybe 15. And I said, and then what do you think will happen? And he said, oh, I'll need to go and see the production manager. And I said, and what will happen there? And he said, I'll have the same conversation again, probably. How long will that take? 10, maybe 15 minutes, he said. So I said, well, there's 40 minutes, approximately 40 minutes of absolute waste of time because the definition of good is not being first determined. And once I've become conscious of this, which was about three months ago, it really frightens me how many conversations around that I hear in organisations where the definition of not good, uh, definition of good is not clear. So there's a lot of sorting through these specialist opinions before we even get started on the proper problem solving. My business partner, Ben, rang me about um, 10 days ago and he said, Oscar, you'd have been smiling at what I heard about, uh, uh, ironically smiling, about 10 minutes ago. He said, I heard probably 15 minute conversation that was caused by the, definite, the expectation of good not being clear. I think there's a lot of waste in organisations where this, um, where, due to this issue. So let's look at the counter to that. And the counter is if you do have a clear expectation of what good looks like, then your definition of not good is objective and the same. So if you do have a clear expectation, then your definition of not good is objective and the same, no matter who, what, when things are being looked at. So therefore, our problem solving and abnormal of abnormal and our building adherence to work standards is actually much easier because there's no sorting through the good, not good opinions. Even to this point, um, and ben, again, Ben brought this to my attention. If you do this really well, the, uh, the defining of normal, then you don't need a subject specialist to spot the difference. So we don't need, a, if we've clearly defined normal, then uh, we don't need a subject expert or a specialist to spot the difference. I think there's a lot of power in that thought. Uh, and just to be clear, uh, one point here, we don't get that only through step up one. So step up one determines normal. There's a part of step up two which um, uh, encourages us to develop ways of making normal very clear. So, so, uh, so being able to get to this point is not only step up one, there's an element of step up two. But I really like the thought, once you've done these two, once you've applied this, um, uh, the determination of normal and made normal really clear through, via some means or another, then we don't need a subject expert to spot the difference. In other words, it can be done quickly by anyone. And I think there's a hell of a lot of value in that in, in, um, in problem solving within an organisation and reacting to the abnormal. It's a, it's a, it's a powerful thought. I just, uh, another thought that's come to me, and this is through that gentleman you see top left is Pat Geary from Story, in, Story Construction in the US. They haven't applied any of this model, not in a, in a, um, in a, um, in a, um, I haven't applied a lot of these philosophies. I guess we've had a number of discussions about this in the last, these philosophies in the last uh, 
two, two or three months through Michael Caston, who's a consultant on, in South Carolina. So we've had a number of conversations about um, uh, the philosophies of the step up model. And he brought last week we were having one of those uh, web one of those um, web com web conferences, if you like. And Pat brought up two points that I'd like to share with you. One of them is uh, a video that relates that that we can relate the step up model to, and the other is a comment he made. And now I'm just going to run this video clip for about two minutes. And in the practice before I started at um, your know, three o'clock East Coast time, I was having some issues with starting this video. But I think I've got it right. There will be a little bit of delay and it'll start and you'll see the picture and hear the sounds. I hope this goes according to plan. Your organization is probably designed to avoid errors when what you want is to have it designed to achieve excellence. The reason is because during the industrial age, we separated the people who were focused on achieving excellence, who were the thinkers and the deciders. They are the only ones who actually thought about that from the doers. All these people, their job was to not make a mistake because they were in compliance mode, and that's not helpful. If we thought about their lives over a shift or a week or a year, it was continuous doing which was about avoiding error. So that's what their mindset was. Don't make a mistake, follow the procedures, don't draw outside of the line. Now though, the most useful thing is to get the people doing the work to actually be involved in making decisions about the work. So now the or modern organization looks like this, that oscillates between doing and deciding and everybody's involved in the, in the decision. The problem is if these people of our organization is stuck in avoiding errors, when we go to decision-making mode, we aren't gonna be very good because we're gonna be stuck, we're gonna be motivated by not making things worse as opposed to achieving something really amazing. And when you get it right, and everyone, we can get a wrapper of achieving excellence, what happens is over time, we have learning and we have quality improvement and we're moving towards something and that happens during the blue work when everyone is involved in, in blue work. So while, Avoiding errors is the design focus of red work. The rhythm of work is to go between imp improvement and then doing the work, decision and doing the work. But the overall wrapper has got to be achieve excellence, not avoid errors. I'm David Marquet. That's your leadership nudge. So you should be back to being able to see me now and hear me. I trust that's the case. So those of you who are familiar with David Marquet, there's a number of short clips um, that he has on the um, internet. They're well worth listening to. He was the captain of the submarine, the Santa Fe, uh, turned it around from being the, one of the worst performing naval vessels uh, in the US to the best in the, in the whole of Navy. And there's a lot of, um, he's developed a lot of material around that, well worth listening to. But there's a point in that clip that I think is really um, relevant to, to what we're talking about here with these, with standardization and work standards, and it's this. He says, at the, about the 50 second mark, he says the blue part is about making decisions about the work whereas red is just doing the work. So I think if we're gonna truly do the, if we're gonna get people to make decisions about the work, then if we've clearly defined normal, if we have a clear expectation of good or normal, then that's gonna be a critical prerequisite to getting people to make decisions about the work. We want normal to be clearly defined if they're gonna do that efficiently and effectively. We don't want them to be having that, have to make a subjective decision. So if we're gonna truly, what, what David just said then makes a hell of a lot of sense. I think if we're gonna do that really effectively, then we need to be able to clearly define normal before we launch into that type of thinking. It would be a critical prerequisite and, and be very powerful too. Imagine if we determined, had a clear expectation of normal for all those people, uh, and then we gave them the rope to make decisions about the work, uh, I think that would be an, very powerful for that uh, picture you can see there. And the second thing that 
Pat brought my attention to was this. He made this comment um, and he said, with no normal abnormal, self-judgment of performance becomes effort-based. In other words, if we don't, if we're back in the red, we don't have normal really clear, then my judgment of my work is how busy am I? How much am I running around? How much am I making judgments? How much am I fighting fires? Whereas if we have, uh, and, and a lot of the fighting fires is first making a judgment on normal. <clears throat> Whereas if we have determined normal, then the self judgment of performance becomes more focused on the, uh, the capability of delivering that and the reaction to abnormal. I think there's a lot of power in those two thoughts. And lastly, the why. Stat work standards are not a basis for finding fault. That's become really evident to me in the last three, um, uh, sort of three to six months. And also, I've better understood why Mr. Cato said this. We didn't hear him say this, by the way, in October last year. It's a quote from John Shook. And uh, John's quoted him as saying, before you can begin with standardised work, you must clarify your work standards. I read that probably after the trip to Japan, probably November. Didn't didn't really understand it. Thought, yeah, I could perhaps see why that might make sense, but it's only through application um, uh, of these philosophies that I can really see the absolute truth in that statement of why it's so essential to to do step up one first and clarify your work standards. Lastly, is it a potential vehicle for positive culture change? Is this um, this, this, these philosophies, and particularly Step Up One, a potential vehicle for positive culture change. Through what I'm about to illustrate, which I think I pre presented in the January webinar, and that is this, a work standard is a hypothesis. The hypothesis is that 100% normal will produce the required outcome. Now this ties in really well with watching the Spear and Bowen article, which says TPS creates a community of scientists. Whenever Toyota creates a specification, standard, the normal if you like, it is establishing sets of hypotheses that can be tested. So if we think of um, the, what's in the green and this work standard as a hypothesis, it sort of makes sense. It ties in with this concept of TPS creating a community of scientists, which was reported over 21 years ago. And also I think the other thought that I've had here is we tend to hear complaint, people tend to, the negatives, the, the naysayers for lean tend, one of the things they tend to bring up is we get locked in by lean, we get tied up by lean. And I think this, if we think of these, um, these work standards as hypotheses, then we've got an opportunity to say, well, we're not locked in, it's just a hypothesis. And we'll adjust when, that, when we, our predictions prove to be incorrect. I'll, I'll show you this in a little bit more detail. I think I can illustrate it through this slide, the, this thought of a hypothesis. So to start with, we have a customer um, who can be internal or external, and we through that from that customer, internal or external, we determine our output work standard. So what you see here is an output from a machine called a jetpack, and the, what the jetpack does is take those four units or four casks of wine, wrap the plastic around them, put them through a shrink tunnel, and bind them together as you see there. So there's two customers. One is the one person who unloads it off the pallet, which is their actual external customer, but there's an internal customer for this too, and that was the palletizer robot that actually picks that up. So the first thing that had to be determined there was what's normal in that output. And at this point, I just want to uh, introduce you to Josh Curry. Josh is the uh, supervisor where we've been doing a lot of this work and has actually been doing the legwork. I've been providing the philosophies, he's been doing the legwork. He works for Warburton Estate, um, and that's the winery that uh, we've been able to try a lot of this stuff out on, and I'm very appreciative to them and also to the efforts Josh has been putting in. So as I said, we determined normal for the output. Then we looked at the machine. This is the jetpack, which, which, which you can see the casks on the way in, uh, by, uh, wraps the plastic around them and then shrink films. So there's a lot of variables in that machine. So we had to determine normal for those variables. Then we had to determine normal for what the human being does uh, in terms of setting up that machine, what their actions are, and what order they do them in, et cetera. So you can see that we build normal from left to right. Now here's the hypothesis. The hypothesis is that if that operator, it happens to be Josh in that photo, if the operator follows their normal, then the settings in the machine will be normal. If the settings in the machine are normal, we'll produce normal in the output. And if we produce normal in the output, the customer will be happy. 
So there's the developing normal left to right. The hypothesis then works right to left. I think it's really powerful. And Tracy Defoe, after that January, January webinar, emphasised this. I think the notion that the work standard is a hypothesis deserves to be on every manager and supervisor's door so they approach workers with curiosity and compassion. Really important statement that I, um, the power of that, I think, is untapped. Uh, but it would be a paradigm shift to think this way. Keeps a potential in that. All right, so six compelling reasons for step up one and how it ties into Mark Rosenthal's statement. First reason is it makes problem solving a lot easier if we have a clear expectation of what good looks like. These are my six learnings, if you like. Much easier because there's no sorting through good and not good opinions. We don't need a subject uh, expert or a specialist to spot the difference. So therefore, spotting the difference is going to be much easier and much quicker. <clears throat> it's a solid platform for making decisions about the work. So if we can determine normal, then it's a really solid platform if we're going to develop that blue, that, uh, that blue environment, if you like, that David was talking about, as opposed to the red environment, which was avoiding errors. And also, as per Pat's comment, with normal identified, self-judgment of performance becomes outcome-based. So self-judgment of performance, once we have normal, now becomes outcome-based. And work standard is a hypothesis. This is the fifth learning, fifth compelling reason. Um, the hypothesis is that 100% normal will produce that required outcome. I think there's heaps of potential for a paradigm shift and a mind shift in the way we think as leaders and managers uh, if, we, if we adopt that thought. And lastly, and the most compelling reason is that Mr. Cato said so. And I think that after 40 years of work, there's probably a fair chance he was right and knew what he was talking about when he said, before you can begin with standardised work, you must clarify your work standards. Now, how do these six things tie in with Mark's opening quote on the opening slide? <clears throat> and it's this, if organisational organizational problem surfacing while executing step ups to and beyond is just normal. So if we do step up one really well, then these organisational problems of abnormal that are going to surface and all the things that go around that and building adherence to work standards, they're just going to be the normal things that any organisation will need to address. But there's going to be a lot of value gained by addressing them. All right, so where to from here? So I've provided you with a model and spoke about a model four times now. And I've given you some examples from Warburn and um, in the March webinar, Ben gave you some examples about uh, A2 Milk in Sydney and what they'd learnt and what they benefited from was applying this model. And you've heard a little bit of Pat Geary's thoughts on the application of this model. And my interpretation of all, what, all those three. So you've just heard my interpretation of all those three and what my learnings are. But what about you guys? How important is it that you develop your own thoughts? Because just thinking something makes sense may not have been beneficial in a year's time. And copying someone else's solutions probably won't work. So this is what we'd like to offer you. And that's a live online program of training then mentoring. So there'll be two, sec two sessions or two sections if you like. The top one uh, on the left, it says two hours live online, illustration and practice of step up one. And then six mentoring sessions to follow. So the first, uh, Two hours live online illustration and practice is available for 300 US dollars per person. We're doing this through Lean Frontiers. So we're offering this jointly through Lean Frontiers. $300 per person to participate in that first row, if you like. Um, if there's more than one person from an organisation, then depending on how many there are, we'll look at um, uh, reducing a per person cost. So there's you can just do that or you can do that and the second bit, which is this minimum six mentoring sessions where you will actually apply it in your workplace and be mentored and coached by myself in your application of the of step up one, just of step up one. Um, and, and you will learn for yourselves and get your own learning about the value of the application of step up one. Now, if you do those six mentoring sessions, that the price for that is US three, well, 1,500 per person. Again, if there's more than one per organisation, will uh, reduce the cost depending on how many there is per organisation. So it's in two stages, the, just the live online workshop, <clears throat> you can just stop it there or you can do both. The live online workshop, then apply it yourself with 
uh, mentoring from myself. If, now, if you want further information on that, please email me as per that email address, oroach at twiinstitute.com. We're gonna uh, just say yes to the first group of eight people. So if you are interested, please um, email me fairly quickly. We're expecting a bit of interest in this, as has occurred in this country, in Australia ourselves. So there's a bit of a, an overview of the Live On Your Line program. It's your opportunity to, to build your own learnings on your own interpretation but, uh, from the philosophies of the Step Up model. So thanks, Lean Frontiers. Thanks again for the opportunity for to run this webinar and present this webinar. Um, any questions, email me, um, oroach at twoinstitute.com, same as previous, and we've got our website address there as well. So thank you again for everyone who's remained uh, and listened to this and also who listens to the recording. I appreciate you giving me your time and have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar. As mentioned earlier, you will receive an email shortly with a link to the recording. Please share this with those who might find it, this information useful. Thanks again, Oscar, and thanks to everyone who participated in today's webinar. Have a great day.